Chris Bukowski of Emerging Civil War for the American Battlefield Trust, and I am standing at the Chancellorsville intersection, the crossroads of fire, as the American Battlefield Trust commemorates the 160th anniversary of the Battle of Chancellorsville. Thanks so much for being with us. We want you to share this. We want you to like this. We want you to subscribe, spread the word so others can join in on these great stories that we're going to have for you over the course of the next few days. In the beginning of May 1863, this becomes the most important crossroads in America because we have Joe Hooker's army consolidating at this point in an attempt to slide in behind Robert E. Lee, who is some 10 miles to the east of us in Fredericksburg. As we look here at the intersection, east is in that direction, west is in that direction, north, and of course, south. Hooker's army is so big, he has to use three different river crossings uh, at U.S. Ford, Ely's Ford, and Germana Ford. He concentrates here, and then he's going to pause as he gets his army together for that advance against Robert E. Lee. In the midst of all of that hubbub, we have an intersection here that has an inn next to it. This is about a day's walk out of Fredericksburg, so that's why this, uh, this house is here in the midst of the 70 square miles of deciduous forest. Uh, I actually forgot to set a timer to see how long it is before someone honks at us while we're out here because that's inevitably going to happen. But So this is, becomes like a really important wayfaring stop for travelers through the wilderness. And to talk about what life was like here, I want to bring in my colleague Sarah K. Byerly. Uh, Sarah, tell us a little bit about what life was like here for the family that lived at this crossroads of fire. Thanks, Chris, and thanks to our viewers who are watching with us here today. As Chris has mentioned, we're here at the Chancellorsville Crossroads. Behind me, you can see the ruins of this large structure known as Chancellorsville. It's a brick building. Um, the first parts of it built around 1816, and then a few additions added as time goes on. But when we get to the Civil War years, you know, this building already has um, about five decades of history associated with it. It's been used as a tavern, as an inn, as a post office. But when we get to the Civil War years, it's in its maybe quieter phase um, of its history. That is until the army shows up, of course. Um, but we have a widow here, um, Frances Chancellor, and her six daughters are living here at Chancellorsville or the Chancellor House during the Civil War period. Um, they did have enslaved persons living with them, though by the spring of 1863, most of those individuals have sought freedom with the Union armies that have come through the area before. And the Chancellor women, the Chancellor girls, are pro-Confederate. So they really prefer it when Confederates and Southerners control the area. Um, they are known to have the officers over for dinners, um, social scene happening here. Um, Sue Chancellor, who's one of the young daughters, um, she's about 14 in the spring of 1863, and she remembers um, these interactions with the officers. And uh, one general gave her a gold coin, which I think is still on display at the Chancellorsville Visitor Center Museum, so you can check that out if you're in the area. Um, but Sue remembers these officers coming. They, you know, they're scouting, they're moving through the area, they stop for a meal. They interact socially with the family. Um, they were teaching some of the older daughters how to play cards, apparently to uh, Francis Chancellor's uh, great dismay. So this is kind of the scene. It's, it's on the quieter side, but you have these interactions with the troops that have come through the area before. And when we get to April 30th, 1863, and these large Union Army Corps are coming into the area, the Chancellor women and girls are going to have a response to that. And one Union soldier would later recall that they were sitting on the porch of this brick home in pretty spring dresses. He calls them light dresses. And um, their manners were not so pretty, though. Um, they start scolding and um, hurling some insults at these Union soldiers and officers coming into the area. So there's a little bit of that military civilian tension going on here. Well, that's not going to prevent their home from being taken over as a headquarters. And I think some of our other guests are going to talk about that a little more. But as fighting begins to unfold around the Chancellorsville area, um, the women are going to take refuge in the basement. And a lot more is going to happen, and they're going to find themselves in the midst of a fiery ordeal. But we're going to save that for a later video because it doesn't happen until May 3rd. Chris? So as the Union Army begins to concentrate on this area, um, this certainly 
change his life for the chancellors. Uh, they're going to hide their food. They're going to try to hide their valuables. The family themselves, though, won't give up their house. They're going to hide in the basement as battle erupts. As we walk across the property, we can see off in the distance, way off in that area, an area called Fairview and beyond it, an area called Hazel Grove. We're going to visit those as part of this tour. You can see some artillery pieces that are here. We'll talk about those in just a minute. Um, but this is going to become a kind of an important artillery platform, particularly on May 3rd. So as Joe Hooker gets to this area himself, he's going to use this as a headquarters because it's going to serve as a good central uh, meeting point for his army where he's going to be able to communicate with the different branches. When it's time for him to eventually send them out, there are three roads that are going to head eastward toward Fredericksburg, and he'll have a good central location to communicate with all three veins. But as his officers begin to collect here, as they begin to chat, um, and they begin to plan, they're not entirely clear about what Hooker has in store. He's been very secretive. Even his second in command, Darius Couch, doesn't really know what's going on. His uh, uh, a portion of his army is back in Fredericksburg under John Sedgwick. Sedgwick doesn't really have a full idea of what the scope of the plan is going to be. And so there's a lot of puzzlement among the uh, Corps commanders about what's going to happen. I'm going to bring on my friend Greg Mertz, who's going to talk a little bit about some of that puzzlement that some of those Corps commanders are experiencing. Yes, one of those Corps commanders that clearly has a different idea of what he thinks the Federal Army should be doing is uh, George Gordon Meade, the commander of the Fifth Corps, and the man that would eventually take command of this army uh, just three days before the Battle of Gettysburg, right after the Battle of Chancellorsville. But he is leading troops that have crossed the Rapidan River at Ely's Ford, marching down the Ely's Ford Road that is just in front of me, and reach this intersection, realizes that he has accomplished quite a bit, that the Union Army has successfully crossed both of the rivers. En route here, he also cut in behind the ford that was most furthest west of Fredericksburg along that one single stretch of the Rappahannock River. So the first ford past the confluence, United States Ford, has cleared that and now some Union troops under the in the second corner, Darius Couch, could move across and join in with them. And once he reached this intersection here at Chancellorsville, realizes that these roads will lead outside of the wilderness. So Meade, who is somebody that has quite a temper um, and, uh, uh, and so forth, is, is actually in a good mood when he arrives here. He is waiting for the troops that crossed over at Germana Ford to arrive, and they would be coming down the orange uh, turnpike from my right to the left. Uh, Henry Slocum is the Corps commander that is in the lead, and we have a cheering of Joseph Hooker that will occur here as Meade goes up to Slocum, slaps him on the back, and he says, hurrah for Joe Hooker. We are on Robert E. Lee's flank and rear, and he doesn't even know it. And referring to some of the roads here, he said, you take the orange turnpike, and I'll take the plank road, or vice versa, and we'll get out of this wilderness, get into some of the open ground. And Slocum had to explain to Meade, he had orders from Hooker to hold up here to wait for additional troops to gather before they would move out. This occurred on the last day of April, and the men would wait here for the rest of the day and not move out until May 1st. Even then, they would wait several hours into the morning before moving out. But just as, and I, as an example of what Chris was talking about, Hooker subordinates do not have a good idea of exactly what Joseph Hooker wants to do. Meade clearly has in mind one thing that he believes the Army should do once they reached here, but is going to be sadly disappointed uh, once he has his conversation with uh, General Slocum. And there you start to see like some of the aggressive attitudes that um, some of these commanders have. And, you know, the Army of the Potomac has this reputation for having a bad bout of McClellanism. I'm going to bring Chris White on here in just a second because Joe Hooker is going to arrive at this intersection and he's going to try to straighten things out. But because he hasn't communicated clearly up to this point, um, his guys aren't quite sure. So that aggressiveness that they're feeling, they're not able to put into practice. Now, a lot of this dates back to direct orders that Hooker got himself when President Lincoln visited this army back in the spring. 
And he pulls Hooker aside and he says, the next time you give battle, put in all of your men. He says it to Hooker on two different occasions. And then there's an occasion where he pulls aside Second Corps Commander Darius Couch, second in command of this army. He says, next time they give battle, put in all your men. If you look at the way the Army of the Potomac has used its superior numbers in previous battles, they've been piecemeal attacks. So they've not been able to use those superior numbers. So Lincoln really urges Hooker to get your men consolidated, get them concentrated, and then use all of that might all at once. Hooker has not communicated this to his subordinates as a result. They're ready to go, and he's not letting them. Hooker himself will eventually get here, and to talk a little bit about that, I'm going to bring on my good friend Chris White. Notice on all of our videos, Chris Bukowski's good friends with a lot of people. Man. But you're still the best. <laughs> yeah. That's what I like to hear. Um, so Joe Hooker, you know, the, it's interesting to see uh, how people interpret him over time. You know, Joe is is a fascinating character to me. I, I would love to have dinner with him, but I wouldn't believe a word that comes out of his mouth. And that's kind of what we see in the wake of the Chancellorsville campaign. In the lead up, he doesn't talk uh, uh, really to his subordinates enough. Uh, he has some trust issues and a lot of that has to do with his own problems because he kind of backstabbed his way into command at times. But he was also a very good commander. He's a competent battlefield commander, one of the best combat leaders in the Army of the Potomac prior to Chancellorsville. Um, he's a 48-year-old Hadley, Massachusetts native who went to the West Point class of 1837. In fact, I always say that you could have a West Point class of 37 reunion here at Chancellorsville. We had Jubal Early, Robert Chilton, Henry Benham, um, Joe Hooker and others who are out here fighting at Chancellorsville. But Joe Hooker, after the battle, never writes a report that we know of or an official report that shows up. And when he does talk about these, uh, talk about this battle, he changes his story depending on who he talks to. And at one point he had uh, asked, you know, he was asked, you know, what was your plan at Chancellorsville? And one person said he tapped his head and said it was all up here. You know, so that doesn't do anyone any good. Whenever you arrive here at this crossroads and you have Henry Slocum and you have George Gordon Meade and you have Oliver Otis Howard who have to have orders of where to go. And then you have more showing up in this area like Couch and then eventually Devil Dan Sickles and others. But one of my favorite descriptions of Joe Hooker comes from Charles Francis Adams. Um, he's from the Adams family up in Massachusetts, not the spooky ones, but the ones who go to the presidency. Um, he says, Hooker in no way and in no degree represents the typical soldiership of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Chancing to be born in Massachusetts, he was in 1861, and from that time forward, little better than a drunken West Point military adventurer. He was altogether devoid of character, insubordinate, and intriguing. It is true that after superseding Burnside, he did some effective work towards organizing the Army of the Potomac. Nevertheless, that was a period in its history when, so far as character was concerned, the Army of the Potomac sank to its lowest point. It was commanded by a trio of each of whom the least said the better. It consisted of Joe Hooker, Dan Sickles, and Dan Butterfield. All of these men were of blemished character. During the winter of 1862-63, when Hooker was in command, headquarters of the Army of the Potomac was a place to which no self-respecting man liked to go and no decent woman could go. It was a combination of a barroom and a brothel. He went on to state that Sickles, Butterfield, and Hooker are the disgrace and bane of this army. There are three humbugs, intriguers, and demagogues. So he doesn't like them very much, if you get the, get the hint. And Sickles, who is in charge of the Third Corps, who really shouldn't be in charge of the Third Corps, is a political general. He is an intriguer. Dan Butterfield, who his father is the, one of the founders of the American Express Company, is a guy the, who a lot of people don't like to get to know, because prior to the war up in Utica, New York, um, Butterfield decided he wanted to start his own fire company because uh, he was bored. And so he creates this fire company and then there's no fires in Utica. So what does he do? He goes out and catches a church on fire. And before his company can get there and put it out, it burned to the ground. Luckily he had dad with him and his American Express card and dad repaid to build the church, rebuild the church. But these are kind of the guys that we're starting to look at. A man who had to claim temporary insanity for murder in Washington, a guy who burned down a church, and then Joe Hooker, who couldn't tell the truth to get out of a paper bag. So this is what some people are starting to look at whenever they look at the high command of the Army of the Potomac. They're looking at Hooker side-eyed. This guy's done some good things so far, but he's got to prove himself in front of Lee, who right now is 3-1-1 one, and one in all of his campaigns. So how do we 
see the Joe Hooker uh, come out as an actual Army commander. That's still to be seen, but Joe Hooker is starting to see the wheels come off here at the Chancellorsville Crossroads right as he's making contact with the enemy. So, of course, if I'm one of the ladies of the Chancellor's family and I've got this uh, rogues collection converging on my house, I've got to imagine that's a pretty tense <laughs> afternoon. I'm going to bring on another of my good friends, Don Fons. He's a former historian here at Fredericksburg National Military Park, uh, Fredericksburg, Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park. And Don, we've got this uh, moment that's just pregnant with possibilities. We've got the Union Army converging. We've got Robert E. Lee still trying to figure things out. We've got civilians that are caught in the middle. Tell me about this moment from your perspective. Well, as you say, this I think in some ways this is the maybe the turning point, certainly the beginning of the turning point for the battle. Uh, Joe Hooker, as you say, has now arrived here. He's got his army exactly where he wanted it with the exception of Stoneman's Cavalry. Uh, he's got his army on either side of Lee. All he now has to do is follow through with his plan and he'll crush Lee between these two pincers of his army. Uh, but at this point, Joe Hooker, who's been very aggressive up to this point in action, but also in talk, uh, Hooker prior to the campaign boasted uh, to everybody you could hear what he was going to do to Robert E. Lee and the Confederacy once he got started. He said, I, I'm going, once I get started, I'll march all the way to New Orleans and no one will be able to stop me. Uh, once he got here to Chancellorsville, he said, uh, you know, that due to the great marches we've just done, the enemy must now come out from behind his defenses or flee. Uh, so he's, he's saying all these things that, uh, you know, that are very aggressive and positive and, uh, if, and it plays well with the troops. The generals who know Hooker, not so much. But anyhow, Hooker's been very aggressive up to this point, but that suddenly changes once he arrives here at Chancellorsville. Suddenly, he puts the brakes on this movement. He orders Slocum uh, and Meade to halt here until he can bring up other troops. He now calls on the Third Corps, which he'd left back at uh, Falmouth, and has them come up, and now he's going to wait for them to arrive the next day. Meanwhile, he's going to begin building uh, earthworks around this intersection to protect it. And uh, as it's pointed out, he doesn't really get started because of the, the arrival of Slocum. He doesn't really get started until uh, mid-morning of, uh, of May the 1st. So you suddenly start seeing caution and hesitation uh, creeping into this, this audacious plan. And we're gonna see, as each day passes, a lot more of that creeping as Joe Hooker goes from being you know, the bold, uh, audacious, uh, brash commander to suddenly being timid Joe Hooker. So, and of course, as all this is going on, Robert E. Lee is trying to read the tea leaves, trying to see what's going on and make some sense of this. Uh, where's Lee's head at this point? Well, at this point, Lee is starting to figure out what's going on. Uh, he, know, he knew a day or two early that troops were crossing uh, the river uh, behind him. Uh, of course, Sedgwick at the same time is crossing the river in front of him. The question is, how many troops are on either side? Is one of these a diversion? And if so, which one? And, uh, but by the time Hooker gets here, Jeb Stewart is now cutting into the uh, Union lines, taking some prisoners. Uh, the core patches that uh, Hooker has instituted not only helped his army, but now is helping Lee because now Lee can identify which corps with him. So now Lee knows that there's a big force behind him. This is not just a diversion in favor of Cedric. Now this is possibly the main effort is here. So now Lee has got to uh, figure out what he's going to do about this. He's basically surrounded. Uh, if you want to look at it that way, but Lee didn't want to look at it that way. Lee, instead of seeing himself as surrounded, uh, sees himself as having the enemy divided. He was outnumbered more than two to one, and if there's any chance he's going to have a victory, he's got to do it by attacking the enemy while they're divided, attack him, attacking them uh, one piece at a time. And Hooker has now given him the chance to do this. So at this point, Lee's going to confer with Stonewall Jackson, and they're going to determine to leave a holding force at Fredericksburg and then march out here with the main force and give battle to Joe Hooker. So it's the evening of April 30th, tense moments, lots of moving parts. Commanders are both finally getting their head around things. We're going to take a trip out to the day one battlefield to start the action of this campaign on May 1st, 1863. I want to thank Don. I want to thank Greg. I want to thank Sarah. I want to thank Chris and Professor Andy Poulton behind the camera for his great work. And I want to thank you for all you're doing to support us. Share these videos. Make sure that you like them. Let your folks know we've got the 160th anniversary of Chancellorsville going on here at the American Battlefield Trust. I'm Chris Mikowski. Thanks for everything you do to support battlefield preservation and education.